following the French administration of Louisiana, the Spanish took over. This is actually the most successful period of colonial Louisiana, for the Spanish turned out to be much better administrators of the colony than were the French. Of course, one of the questions that arises right away is why did the French transfer the colony over to Spain? And so we're going to see the end of French rule and the French and Indian War, and then we'll see an overview of Spanish Louisiana, then its first governor, Don Antonio de Aloha, then the O'Reilly factor, see that little play on words there, Unzaga over New Orleans, and Galvez and the American Revolution, then Don Esteban Miro, then the Spanish bringing in settlers, this is the real basis of the success of the Spanish, and then we'll have free women of color, agriculture under the Spanish, Spanish religion and culture, and then the Anglo-American invasion. The French and Indian War is treated in depth in most United States history classes in the first half of United States history. It was called the Seven Years' War in Europe. It's called the French-Indian War over here. Uh, it lasted actually nine years on the continent, but it lasted seven years um, on, uh, in Europe. Uh, essentially, you had France and Spain and its satellite allies against England. And in the end, England won. England captured Canada and they isolated Louisiana. And during that time, Louis Biot, the Chevalier de Kellerec, uh, who has a street named after him in the Faubourg Marigny, organized the defenses of Louisiana. When it was apparent that the uh, French were going to lose this war, tremendous humiliation for the French. They ceded Louisiana to Spain in 1762, called the Treaty of Fontainebleau. Then they made the Peace of Paris, or the Treaty of Paris in 1763, and gave up all of Canada to England. Spain, for its part, lost East and West Florida. There was a strong group of Acadians in Nova Scotia called the Acadians. And, um, excuse me, the Acadians are called Acadians, yes. And they were deported because they would not take the oath of loyalty to the king. Not all of them were deported, but a large number of them were deported. And that, this is ethnic cleansing. In Louisiana, Jean Miette and Bienville tried to convince the court to keep New Orleans French. And the citizens did not react well to the fact that they were going to be turned over to Spain. And so they acted with open hostility. Now, Spain ruled Louisiana for only 40 years, but it was more effective and innovative than the French. At first, the French colonists would not accept the new overlords, but after time, they began to admire the Spanish and respect the Spanish. And then, they loved the Spanish. They revered the Spanish. It took time, but by the end, they did not want to see the Spanish go.
But like I said, the Spanish were not well received at first, and case in point was Don Antonio de Oloa, a member of the French Science Academy who was appointed governor in 1765. He was a brilliant man, but very scatterbrained and devoid of tact. We probably would have said that he might have had maybe a mild case of Asperger's syndrome. We don't know, of course. He was forced to rely on French troops that remained in the colony to maintain order, and he comes in right away and he broke the trading patterns by limiting the ports of trade. Spanish mercantilism was taking over for French mercantilism. But he did, however, take a tour of the province and began to improve relations with the natives that had suffered when Bienville was beginning to uh, decline in his leadership. Ulloa's lack of tact and his uh, inability to find compromise led to the rebellion of 1768. Now this is not an independence movement, it was a grievance movement, very much like the American Revolution was at the beginning. Remember, the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War, was a rebellion based on grievances to hear their problems redressed by the Crown. Only later did they decide to go for independence. Well. In Louisiana, this was a grievance movement to restore French control under the Spanish crown. They would uh, remain under the Spanish crown, but they wanted to have French control. Uh, the Superior Council failed to accept Ulloa. They said that he did not properly present his credentials and because he closed the trade with France. The rebellion took place when the Superior Council took control of the colony and proclaimed Ulloa invalid. Uloa then retreated to the re protection of a Spanish ship with his wife and his young baby child. The French leaders then began to stir trouble in the settlements led by Gilbert Antoine de saint maxent The rebels then went to France to petition the king. Meanwhile, the Spanish sent troops. They were under the command of this fellow right here. His name is Don Alejandro O'Reilly. That name is not Spanish, is it? O'Reilly is an Irish name. Now you have to understand something. In the late 1700s, the nations of Europe, their armies were largely staffed and even led by Irish soldiers. These Irish soldiers are called the Wild Geese. They had left Ireland after the wars of rebellion against England and they had essentially hired themselves out to the armies of Spain, France, the Papacy, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Poles, there were even Irish and the Russian armies. O'Reilly is one of these wild geese, and he is the one who is sent to New Orleans to restore order. Marshal Alejandro Conde O'Reilly was born Alexander O'Reilly in County Meath, Ireland. He was first in the Navy and then went to the Army where he became a Brigadier General and a military reformer. 
He arrived in Louisiana with 2,000 troops and a flotilla of ships, a great show of strength. He entered New Orleans with great ceremony. He made a very brief and thorough investigation. He called the leaders of the rebellion in to talk with them. He heard their complaints. He found out exactly what he did, and then he put them on trial and convicted them. Half of them were executed, the other half were sentenced to prison. For that he was known as Bloody O'Reilly. And he turned evidently to the rest of New Orleans. He says, now how's that for showing me credentials? Despite his nickname, O'Reilly continued to work over New Orleans in the Spanish way. He reformed a great many things in New Orleans, military, judicial, civilian affairs. He fixed the prices on commodities. Commodities are things that everybody needs, salt, grain, and so forth. He eased the problem of the food supply. He expelled all the smugglers. He gave especially harsh treatment to the British. He was Irish, after all developed a steady trade with Cuba and other Spanish ports, allowed slaves to purchase their freedom. He enabled slave owners to more easily manumit slaves, that is, release them. He prohibited the enslavement of Indians. He regularized the weights and measurements used in the marketplaces so that there was no fraud. He regulated doctors and surgeons, proved public safety by funding bridge and levee maintenance. He abolished the French legal code. He replaced it with what is known as the Code O'Reilly. And he firmly placed Louisiana as a dependency of the military and political establishment in Cuba, which means that many of the records of Louisiana during the Spanish period are still in Havana. And the recent opening of relations between the United States and Cuba means that we're now able to access those archives. He replaced the Superior Council with the Spanish colonial governing body called the Cabildo, which means capital. Cabildo is not a building, it's a form of government. It's a far more representative and effective governing body than the very exclusive Superior Council. And there you see a original of the Code de O'Reilly and the Louisiana archives. O'Reilly was the military governor. The, the civilian governor, the administrative governor, was Louis Unzaga de Amazaga. He was a hero of the Seven Years' War and played the good cop to O'Reilly's bad cop. He slowly but surely begins to win the respect of the French colonists. He even married a French woman, Marie Elizabeth de Saint-Maxent. He turned a blind eye to smuggling in the black market. If I don't recognize it, it doesn't exist. And thus, he improves the economy of New Orleans and the economy as a whole. He then established the outpost of St. Martinville in southwest Louisiana, which is to the southeast of 
Lafayette as the oldest settlement in Acadiana. When he retired, he was very popular. On the map in red, you see the um, red dot indicating St. Martinville in St. Martin Parish, which is the only parish in Louisiana that is two non-contiguous sections. That is, there's a Upper St. Martin Parish and a Lower St. Martin Parish. And you pass through St. Martin Parish when you're crossing over the Atchafalaya Spillway heading toward Lafayette on I-10. Galvez and the American Revolution. Gonzaga is replaced by Bernardo Vicente de Galvez y Madrid, who is the Vicount of Galveston and Count of Galvez. He was governor from 1776 until 1783. He strengthened the military and employed excellent subordinates who were French. This is, shows how well the French and the Spanish would work together after a while. Pierre Bouligny even have a uh, a suburb of New Orleans named after him, Faubourg Bouligny. Uh, he again prohibited British smuggling, gave subsidies to farmers and lumbermen to make sure that they were still working and producing, and he increased trade both within Louisiana and among the Spanish ports. Galvez is best known for his work during the American Revolution. In fact, he is one of three non-Americans given honorary American citizenship, the other two being the Marquis de Lafayette and Winston Churchill. During the American Revolution, Spain at first su secretly supported the Americans and New Orleans became a massive supply depot for the Continental Army. After the Battle of Saratoga, Spain formally entered the war in 1779, and Galvez and American Commodore Oliver Pollock became chief American allies with each other. Galvez then decided to undertake his own campaign. He attacked and captured Baton Rouge, which was in the far west of Spanish West Florida. He then uh, attacked and captured Mobile in 1781. He then took the city of Pensacola, proclaiming that he would go across the sandbar himself if needed, and so his motto became, Yo Solo, I Myself, or Me Alone. It was a Spanish victory. They re he recaptured all of Florida, and in doing so, however, Spain became an immediate threat to the new United States because Florida was on the southern border of Georgia. Nonetheless, Galvez was honored by the United States, and for this he was appointed Viceroy to Mexico, which was the top colonial position in the Spanish Empire, and he was in charge of all that gold. Unfortunately, he didn't live long afterwards. He died in 1786 in Mexico City, a very young man at the time, in his 40s. Understand something also about Spain and the American Revolution, that they were not taking part in the American Revolution 
for the sake of American ideals. They were in it to get back at the British and to gain their territories that they lost. Nonetheless, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. These maps show the campaigns of Galvez, and at the lower left, you see the map of the city of Pensacola and the terms of the surrender that Galvez worked out with the British in Pensacola. Galvez is, of course, honored throughout the Gulf Coast. We have a street in New Orleans named after him, North and South Galvez Street, and the statue of Galvez that stands in front of the World Trade Center, soon to be uh, a Four Seasons Hotel, I believe. And that is the statue of Galvez in Mobile, Alabama. While Galvez was out on campaign, Don Esteban Miro, not quite as charming and charismatic as Galvez was, was back home in Louisiana running the show. He did a great deal of improvements to the public image and with Native Americans. He built the Spanish Opera House. The Spanish Opera House is still there to this day. In fact, many of you all who have gone to the French Quarter and done the touristy thing should well know what the Spanish Opera House is because it's now called Pat O'Brien's. There was a great fire in New Orleans in 1788 that destroyed most of the French Quarter. He responded very quickly and decisively to the fire. And in doing so, gave Louisiana, a, I mean New Orleans, a Spanish makeover, which is why the French Quarter looks so Spanish. Miro also kept the Inquisition from establishing itself in Louisiana, which was a very vile organization and was very, uh, uh, how would I put it, um, antagonistic toward Jews and Protestants. He secured the Spanish position by bringing in more immigrants, and then he closed the Mississippi to American traffic in 1784, which gathered the attention of the American government that said, we need to do something about New Orleans. We need New Orleans too much to have it closed like this. The reason that the Spanish were so good at being colonial overlords of Louisiana is that they brought in settlers. They did not really uh, uh, limit themselves to just French convicts and soldiers that couldn't make it. They were very welcoming to all immigrants. And refugees from Nova Scotia, the Atlantic, and the Caribbean were soon coming for Louisiana. Most notably, the, the Acadians. These are the French-speaking peasants that came from Nova Scotia. Roman Catholic, very clannish. Their forced migration from Nova Scotia was called the derangement. In fact, that uh, derangement is encapsulated in the poem Evangeline by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The Spanish invited the Acadians to Louisiana. They recruited them to settle south and southwest Louisiana. Louisiana had lacked hard-working agricultural settlers. They became known as the Cajuns, and they invigorated the Louisiana economy. 
and he also invigorated the Catholic faith in Louisiana. There you see the Acadian flag, the flag of the Acadian nation in Louisiana. Another group to come and settle in Louisiana were the Isleños. These are the residents of the Canary Islands. They're Spanish, but they had African roots. Many came to Louisiana to escape terrible poverty. They settled first in Tangible Hope Parish, but later moved down to St. Bernard Parish. And that's why you see many people in St. Bernard Parish with EZ after their name, like Nunez and Perez. Another group were the Haitians. French-speaking emigrants who were escaping the French Revolution that was going on in Saint-Domingue. Both blacks and whites from Haiti enhanced the Creole culture in Louisiana. On the map on the left, you see where the Canary Islands are located off the coast of Africa. And on the lower right, you see the major towns of the Isleño settlements, eventually settling in St. Bernard. Another important part of the Louisiana demographic were free women of color. Free women of color comprise more than half the population of free black people in Louisiana. They're often the most faithful Catholics. They served as godparents to Indian Catholics. They own land and they own slaves. Black people did own slaves in Louisiana. Most of the time, it was them purchasing their own family members to give them freedom eventually. Most gained freedom through concubinage. And one of the most notable of these was Madame Marie Couvent, a wealthy free woman of color and a slave owner who bequeathed her fortune to black education and established the St. Louis School of the Holy Redeemer, the uh, the old building is still in the Farberg Marigny corner of Turo and Dauphine. What many people think was very common was the placage, or placage as some would call it. That is where free women of color uh, would uh, give their daughters to uh, white men so that they could gain respectability. And I strongly urge you to read the article about placage in the uh, in the Moodle that I put on there for you. The infusion of hard-working Germans and Acadians increased the agricultural production of Louisiana tenfold. You now had a strong cash crop economy, sugar, tobacco, cotton, cattle. Abbeville was the end of the southern cattle drive from the west. 
you also had a tremendous trade. You had a frontier trade economy. A frontier trade economy means that the prices are not set by market forces. Instead, the prices are set by relationships and means it's open to outside influences and innovations. You also had the development of a unique cuisine in Louisiana based on seafood, meats like pork and chicken, and of course, spices. Louisianians grew tobacco, but sugar and cotton became the backbone of the Louisiana economy in agriculture. Sugar was grown first by both the Jesuits and then Alexander de Braille. Etienne de Boré, the first official mayor of New Orleans, was the father of the sugar industry in Louisiana. He perfected sugar refinement. He was like the Eli Whitney of the sugar industry. His plantation later became Audubon Park. Cotton was grown mostly along the Red River in north and northwest Louisiana. A priest named Bobois made a crude cotton gin, but he never perfected it. Daniel Clark made a replica of Eli Whitney's cotton gin, and this increased Louisiana's cotton production tenfold. And as you well know from studying United States history, that the cotton gin essentially reinvigorated the slave trade as well, which was dying off prior to the cotton gin's invention. Religious practice under the Spanish was languid at best. Uh, people were Catholic but in name only. Uh, the Protestant infusion began with the German immigrants and then the Anglo-American settlers. And so this was a threat to the Catholic community. Uh, religious administration was no longer uh, done in New Orleans. Instead, it was transferred to Santiago, Cuba, and then to Havana. And the auxiliary bishop of Santiago made his residence in New Orleans. Eventually, New Orleans was made its own diocese, which meant it got its own bishop in 1793, and St. Louis became the cathedral. Now, French priests remained throughout the Spanish period, and Spanish priests then arrived in 1772, and as is typical of the priests, uh, they could be very uh, territorial, and they clashed with each other. At best, the church was ignored. At worst, it was openly fought. until another priest arrived by the name of Antonio de Sedella, a 
a Capuchin friar from Spain who had the look about him that when he looked at you, you knew you were being looked at. They called him Pierre Antoine, the French did, and eventually, despite his stern demeanor, he earned the love and admiration of the French in New Orleans and literally walked the streets on Sunday saying, Go to Mass, your immortal soul depends upon it, and literally packing the cathedral with fiery sermons. The Children of Mary, established in 1740, was the first Catholic sodality that is a religious organization in the United States. They were an organization of lay women, and they were slaves and housewives and daughters who gave an example of Christian living. Spanish church organization was subject to what was known as the Patronato Real. That meant that the king of Spain, who was a member of the austere family called the Habsburgs, uh, had a vote or veto over the appointment of bishops and so forth. In other words, that the Pope didn't simply appoint a bishop to Louisiana, the Spanish king had a say in it. And so the Spanish crown appointed the bishops, they established the dioceses and paid clerical salaries, they purchased land, they built churches, they enforced church laws, and they trained Irish missionaries to convert Protestants. It wasn't just Irish soldiers that left Ireland, it was also Irish priests. Now the French Revolution that took place from 17, really from 1789 until really uh, to this day. Many people argue that the French Revolution is still going on, but at its height it was 1792 to 1796, and the revolution affected Spain. The revolution was like a virus that affected the nations around France as well as France itself. The, the revolution was very secular. It, it rejected the church and its leadership in France and in other places, and so this impeded church growth in the French colonies for almost 20 years. Now, the re revolution being so violent that many people left France and other countries, and so many refugees came to Louisiana, especially priests who were refugees. At first, the church, especially among the lower priests, supported the revolution, but then it became too violent and too secular even for them. What about art and architecture in Louisiana, or as we like to say, art and architecture? Well, you had a printing press established in 1760. Julien de Podres was the uh, poet laureate of New Orleans. Um, you saw the picture of uh, Père Antoine that was done by Antonio Salazar. He did most of the portraits that you'll see in the Cabildo and in the Presbyter. And because of the fire, New Orleans received a Mediterranean makeover. What the fire didn't destroy, hurricanes knocked down the cathedral. You had architect uh, Gilbert Guillemard, who rebuilt the St. Louis Cathedral, the Cabildo, the Presbyter, and the Pondalba buildings. And they were financed by a very rich Spaniard by the name of Don Andres Amanesta de Irajas. And that, of course, means that he has a street named after him, New Orleans, Almanesta Avenue. That's where you go out to bury the body, so to speak.
From the 1790s onward, Spain had to deal with a large number of Anglo-Americans moving downriver into the city from the United States. They were called cane tucks by the Spanish because they were uh, from the region of Kentucky. Miro allowed them at first to solidify the colonial economy and he encouraged settlement. But then when they got a little too numerous, Miro closed the port of New Orleans. This meant that the United States really needed to have a treaty of some sort so that they could use the port of New Orleans without any trouble. And so they sent Charles Pinckney to Madrid and he worked out the Treaty of San Lorenzo, a Pinckney's Treaty. First of all, he sets the boundary of Florida at 31 degrees north. That's why Louisiana has the state line that you cross over on I-59 there. The United States was given full navigation on the river and the United States was given right of deposit in New Orleans warehouses. That meant that you could offload your cargo in New Orleans and wait for the ship to pick it up or the ship could offload its cargo to wait for the barge to pick it up and it would be stored in a warehouse. Right of deposit was the key in this whole treaty. In the late 1790s, Governor Manuel Salcedo suspended right of deposit. And then Napoleon toppled the Spanish regime, put his older brother Joseph on the throne of Spain. He then forces Spain to uh, transfer Louisiana back to France, called the Third Treaty of San Ildefonso. And when the Americans caught wind of the transfer, this was a national security problem. To have a strong France on your western flank as opposed to a weak Spain was considered unacceptable to the Thomas Jefferson administration. Okay, so you see the line furthest north. That's what the Spanish said was the border of West Florida. The United States uh, said no, it's down where the red shaded in parishes and counties are located. The Spanish then tried to come a little further south, uh, more toward Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, again, the Americans said no, and eventually it was settled that the 31st parallel, that is the top of the shaded area of red is the boundary of Louisiana. And there, of course, you see in the blue Baton Rouge, and in the red with the blue is New Orleans, where right of deposit was granted.